this is our 15th year for a model built on faith and uh, was doing some calculations and um, delighted uh, to look at that and say, wow, this is, um, we've come a long way with this, a very long way. And, and I'm excited and I'm, ex I'm ecstatic that we have been so successful with this program. And I trust that we've helped a lot of nonprofit organizations and faith-based organizations. Um, this session is called Technology Essentials Part Two. You may recall that last month in part one, we looked at hybrid program planning. And in that session, we looked at the fact that we need technology in our program planning now, in our classic program planning, um, specifically so that we can have a greater impact and utilize this wonderful tool that's available to us. We promised that we were going to do a part two, and this is part two, Technology Essentials Part Two, Education Justice for Our Youth. What do we mean by that? We mean that we can move forward with providing programming. Technology is an amazing path forward, but there has to also be access. So what we did this time is we brought together those who are working in technology, those who are working in education, community members, faith members. And one of the things we want to do is to have a conversation. This is a round table. So we wanna have a conversation about what we all can do together to make sure that our kids have something that they have never had. Even since I was a child, they've never had a level playing field. So as the rest of you, I'm tired of all the chat about a, a level playing field and the people that we have in the room um, and those that we have on the Zoom as well are individuals who can do something about that and move us forward so because our kids can't wait for everybody to get it together before they move into the futures we're always talking about. Next slide, please. So um, if you wanna change your Zoom name uh, with all the Zooms that you've been doing, you should have either done it by now or know how to do it. So we're gonna move to the next slide. <laughs> next slide, please, Shai. Okay, here are some of our housekeeping rules. Uh, the main thing that I would like to um, just ask is that you, um, you, mute, you mute yourself. We have five speakers and we wanna make sure that you can hear everything. Um, during this session, we're going to be relying heavily on chat because the speakers want to make sure that the conversation that we hear, the line of thought that we hear is coming from our speakers, but we also want your input. So we're asking that during this whole time while our speakers are on, that you include your questions in the chat and we will make sure that you are heard. We are going to take a couple of short breaks. We'll let you know when. And there also is going to be a giveaway. Can we see the next slide? I think that that's, uh, here it is. Yes. So we're, going to be, we're going to be asking you some questions. So you have to put your thinking caps on because there's money involved here. So it's extremely important that you are on it. You don't want to miss this opportunity. Next. Okay, so just very quickly, just like to introduce you to the team. This is an amazing team. Um, Sandra Alexander is the executive director of Book Her. We, our amazing funder is Michelle Miles Chambers with a, a senior program officer with San Francisco Foundation Faiths. Saran Stokes, program assistant with that same program. Ebony Smith, program assistant with Faith. Denise DeLuca, outreach specialist with Occur. Shai Alderman, Operations Manager, and Simone Stokes, Administrative Assistant with OCAR. And we, this is an amazing team and I'm so grateful for all of them. Next, please. Next, please. <laughs> I'm Carmen Bogan. Um, I've been doing this for as long as this program has been in existence because I um, helped to design this program with David Glover. So it's been many, many years. 
uh, and maybe I should get that 25 years out of there because it's dating me, but I am also the CEO of my own consulting firm, The Bogan Group, and support uh, faiths, organizations, foundations, um, and community organizations. Next. Our fearless leader for today is Kevin Hill. He is the founder of Akaben Organizing. And I'm gonna read this because it is so impressive. And, you know, a lot of people really are impressive on paper, but Kevin is an impressive person in a lot of ways. He is kind, he cares about this work a lot. And he's a father of young children. And so he has a personal stake in our success in this arena. Kevin is originally from Cleveland. He's been rooted in the Bay Area since 2000. He's the son of a social worker. He is inspired to lend his expertise to community development efforts. And he has been doing that now for some time. Kevin firmly believes that educating our young people is the best investment we can make in building a healthier, safer, more vibrant, and more inclusive community for everyone in Oakland. He has significant experience in research, quantitative analysis, consulting, project management, higher ed curriculum development and teaching, tutoring, mentoring, entrepreneurship, and community organizing. Kevin's background has positioned him perfectly for this time. He founded the Black Lives Voter Guide, which we really need right now, uh, especially before these midterms come up, organizes with the Brotherhood of Elders Network and serves the uh, Oakland Unified School District Reparations for Black Students Task Force. And this session today speaks directly to that. Soon he plans to release the BYD book. He's gonna tell you more about that, but it's a directory of black led youth development programs. He accepts his responsibility to lead positive change in our community and is intensely motivated to continue the good work laid down by our ancestors. And we're presenting this session because we hope that you will join Kevin in this and all of us. And so it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our moderator for today, Kevin Hill. Thank you, Carmen, you're far, far too kind. And uh, welcome everyone. As I share my screen, I just want to um, make sure everyone is, is settled in and comfortable. And uh, I want to give a special thanks to the folks at, at Occur. Thank you, Sandra, and also the folks at uh, San Francisco Foundation for, um, for putting this on. Uh, so thank you, Michelle, as well. Um, as Carmen mentioned, if you have questions while any of our speakers are uh, presenting, please put those questions in the chat and we will get to as many of those questions when we get to the round table portion of our program. So as long as you can see my screen just fine, I will um, talk to you all about uh, some pathways that we have for developing our Black youth. I want to start by grounding us in purpose, uh, why we're here today and what we can do with this opportunity. Uh, so I want to be really clear that uh, the goal of this meeting today isn't to just be another Zoom meeting that you had in your schedule for Thursday the 28th. Like, who did we help? Uh, how do we make our community better? What were we able to build together? One of the Babas in the Brotherhood of Elders, Baba Greg Hodge, uh, shared this African proverb with me. Um, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. So that may be something that many of you have heard before. And I thought it was fitting for today because the call to action is to really come together and to make the most of our time, not only today, but after this meeting and uh, figure out what we can really build. Because ultimately, what we need to focus on is developing structures that produce healthy, well-educated people. Because in that case, uh, everyone wins. Everyone among us wins when we have more healthy, well-educated people in our community. 
I want to talk a little bit about how, um, as I was growing up, I received help in different programs. Um, I was part of the Big Brothers Big Sisters program. I had a big brother when I was roughly in middle school. The picture you see in the middle is my middle school in uh, Cleveland Heights, Ohio. And I don't remember the name of the program, but I was in a program at that time for kids who showed promise, but were underperforming academically. And it really interrupted the path that I was on with my academics and helped to set me on the right path. That's a program that I very much benefited from. And I was also a member of Inroads uh, that I got involved in late in my high school years to help uh, uh, get me ready for internships while I was in college. And I ended up having five different internships while I was in college, which really prepared me for my career. <clears throat> One of the things that I think about when I uh, go back to my middle school experience is that despite going to a majority black high school, going on to college, going on to grad school, that middle school that you see there, that was the last time I had a black teacher. And uh, for any, not just black folks, but any folks who don't have the benefit of being educated by black educators, um, then we, th that's an area where we have a big opportunity to, to do better. <clears throat> I wanna talk about some of the programs also that I've contributed to over the years in my 20s and 30s into my 40s whether it be Bob Moses' algebra project that I uh, worked on when I was in high school or um, different mentoring and tutoring opportunities or some of the things that I founded, which I'll talk to you about in a moment. I, I share this with you just to say, and these are just some of the ones that I could remember. And I share this with you to say that when folks are given opportunities and are given those guardrails to make sure that their childhood goes in a positive direction, there's an amplifying effect to what people grow up and achieve and become and contribute. So that's something that I want us all to keep in mind uh, in terms of how important it is to make sure that as many of our young people uh, are given those same guardrails to um, make sure that they're run on the right track with their lives. So I got into, I won't talk uh, too much about what I did for uh, a living for the first 20 years of my career, um, but I worked in, in finance and I worked in technology and consulting. I taught at UC Berkeley in higher education as well. <clears throat> and all of that really prepared me for how I want to show up in, in community. And so as Carmen mentioned, I founded the Black Lives Voter Guide, which um, consolidates the perspectives of our black social justice leaders. I talk to the black social justice leaders in our community and where there's a consensus, we publish uh, endorsements of uh, political candidates uh, to help uh, guide voters who not only need to be told to go register and to go vote, but also need a bit of a cheat sheet on these down ballot races because these local elections really affect our lives so greatly. And I'm also working on the, the BYD book. BYD stands for Black Youth Development. And I've partnered with all of the Black-led youth development organizations that, that I uh, could find here in Oakland, including Brandon at Hidden Genius Project, Selena at EOYDC, and many others. And the idea there is to really amplify their work to help um, caregivers and parents of Black youth to understand what kinds of programs are available to them from uh, Black-led organizations. And there's a ton of wonderful programs. I, I um, couldn't even do them justice in this couple of minutes, but um, they cover a whole range of very, very important topics. And you'll hear about a couple of those today. I also serve on the Reparations for Black Students Task Force and organize with their campaign. And I, um, serve with the Brotherhood of Elders Network, who has given um, such a tremendous foundation of um, opportunity for us to do some great work. And I want to um, talk about what we're doing there specifically. So I organize with the Education Committee in the Brotherhood of Elders, and we have established a Black education vision that we think not only is appropriate for Oakland, but for communities all across the country. And we have six focus areas that, that I want to talk to you about. 
Uh, first of all, community schools. Uh, community schools uh, should be relationship centered, offer culturally relevant curriculum, focus on health and wellness, and offer family supports. And um, just to be clear, each of these six focus areas, uh, there we have specific ideas and project proposals that underlie these areas. So these aren't just talking points or things that we sound great, but these are things that we on the education committee um, actively are working on or want to work on. So to the extent that um, anyone has interest in partnering on any of these, please reach out to me. I'll put my contact information at the end. So community schools, culturally relevant curriculum is important. So I mentioned uh, how important it is to have a black educators in front of our young people and uh, what those folks teach in the curriculum uh, and where that curriculum came from is critically important. <sighs> I don't believe that we can eradicate racism without reparations, without the repair, and uh, I believe that education is one of the most critical components of what that would look like. So having our schools be equitably, re equitably resourced and targeting opportunities um, to address the harm that's been done in uh, Black neighborhoods is critically important as well. <clears throat> Uh, we have a brother on the education committee, Randy Sharaguchi, who um, leads Urban Ed Academy, and he is intently focused on um, what it looks like to recruit, deploy, and support Black educators. And there are uh, many projects that we have to uh, support this topic as well. We came up with the idea of a Black education navigation hub. So the idea is to give parents and caregivers the resources they need to, to feel confident they're navigating the, the school system that their child is a part of in such a way that really positions them for success and is a trusted uh, voice for what, uh, you know, what the opportunities are in terms of enrollment and programming, et cetera. Lastly, we thought about what it looks like to educate kids outside of the classroom. Things like mentorship programs, rites of passage programs, internships, et cetera. So there's a whole lot that we could be thinking about that really wrap around the whole child, uh, not just during the school day as well. So these are the six focus areas that, that we're really thinking about uh, in terms of a black education vision. And we look forward to working with anyone on uh, what that looks like to um, turn these into reality. Like I said, there's specific projects that underlie these ideas. So I want to uh, leave you with this, uh, these main ideas. Uh, what does success look like when, uh, when young folks participate in youth development program? These aren't my ideas. These are the ideas from our leaders of Black youth development programs. When I engaged each of them last year, I asked, what does success look like when young people uh, participate in your program? And they told me. There happened to be, uh, there happened to be 10 things that bubbled up. Um, and I use here some Adinkra symbols from West Africa because it was very interesting to me that what we're asking for is very much rooted in West African traditions and, uh, and what we need and what success looks like is very much uh, has been represented for generations in, in our culture. Um, so first, the needs of our young people need to be outlined by black leaders and black parents, as opposed to a tops down model coming from a think tank outside the community. Uh, bottoms up is, uh, is the way that um, we know that we're going to be able to get what our community needs. Self-actualization is important uh, because uh, it really uh, underscores the idea that everyone should have the opportunity and the expectation to be the very ve best version of themselves. The literacy rates that we experience in OUSD and Oakland at large um, will show you that Black uh, learners um, uh, are below grade level uh, in uh, way higher numbers than their counterparts from other backgrounds. And that we can't accept that. We, we must uh, make sure that we have uh, literacy rates that meet or exceed uh, our peers. Uh, students are supported and taught not police. So it's important that we give kids what they need as opposed to 
uh, punitive measures and in, in, uh, punishment. We also need to build infrastructure to support learning. So that's something that, uh, that I'm sure uh, Brandon will talk about, that Selena will talk about. These guardrails, as I mentioned, are incredibly important to make sure that kids are steered in the right direction. We also want to make sure our young people develop a broader worldview outside of what they see in their neighborhood or on their block. It, that, uh, those kinds of extracurricular activities will lead, lead to a lifelong um, love of learning. And we want to make sure that kids who have mentors, who come from homes that are less stable, that where they experience trauma, that they have access to mentors um, when they need them. And also that students develop a sense of community and are offered leadership opportunities when they're, when they're called to action. And lastly, uh, we wanna make sure that our young people reach adulthood ready for what's next in their careers, whether it be, col uh, uh, whether it be college or whether it be careers. We wanna make sure that folks are prepared and confident in what the options are ahead of them when they hit adulthood. So I'll leave you uh, with, uh, with our purpose and just remind us that this is our time to come together. It's our chance to make a difference and to build systems that will uh, impact our community in a positive way. And I encourage all of us to find someone on this, uh, on this call today, whether it's one of the presenters, whether it's one of the um, participants to, um, to work with and to think about how we can move things forward from your corner of the world and where we can meet ours as well. Here's my contact information. Um, and I'm sure that we'll, we'll show it again later, but please feel free to reach out or, um, or hit me up in the chat, et cetera. And with that, I want to introduce uh, Brother Brandon Nicholson. Um, he is a, a very impressive individual. The work that he has uh, done with Hidden Genius Project is unparalleled here in Oakland. Um, and I'll tell you about him. So Brandon is an Oakland native and he founded the Hidden Genius Project. He's dedicated his life to promoting equity in the public realm, particularly in the education space. He had a previous stint as senior uh, evaluator and consultant where he conducted research, evaluation, and consulted on a range of projects related to the intersection of education policy and workforce and economic development. <clears throat> he uh, recognized the potential for technology to bolster the domestic and global economy as black, black populations and others gain more equitable access to growth sectors. Brandon has conducted substantial research in the areas of education and youth development with a particular focus on issues of equity and access in K through 12 education for high potential populations. He has considerable experience investigating linkages among race, class, and youth development. Brandon will be presented by Chiron, uh, will be presenting with Chiron Loggins, who is a Hidden Genius alum and their digital communications intern. So he's a long standing member of the Hidden Genius family. He's been both a peer and a mentor to other geniuses. Chiron first joined the Hidden Genius Project in 2016 as a student of their intensive immersion program and he later served as one of the senior most youth educators. And he's proudly serving as the digital communications intern. He serves to champion the youth in his community and displays his passion for furthering opportunities of young black men in his work with the Hidden Genius Project and his endeavors beyond, which includes studies at San Jose State University, good work, and as well as a work in the fields of real estate and community development. It's my pleasure to introduce both Brandon and Chiron to all of you, and I will um, hand over screen sharing to them. Thank you. Hey guys, um, Brandon, I think I will take point on presenting our screen. Sure, you're the uh, technical expert. So you, may as well. you guys all, um, welcome. And I'll let Brandon start us off with our first little spiel. So, I mean, you want to at least say the mission statement or something, right? Tell me what we do. Well, certainly. So the Hidden Genius Project trains and mentors Black male youth in technology creation, entrepreneurship, and leadership skills to transform our lives and communities. Um, and we do that in a myriad of ways, um, most largely our intensive program. Um, and we've offered over 612 
a thousand hours of direct training since 2012. And that's mentorship, that's our intensive program, uh, that's our catalyst, that's all the things that we do. And we're currently running our intensive immersion programs in LA, Detroit, Oakland, and Richmond, hoping to expand uh, even further. And so we are really big on doing our mission, not just through teaching geniuses how to code or making sure that they can create things, but in holistically training them and holistically making sure that they are being grown as a whole person, making sure that they're developing confidence in themselves, developing teamwork skills, developing a sense of community. Um, and I'll let Brandon tell you guys a little bit about how we do that and what that means to us. Uh, absolutely. And, oh, nice. Uh, you know, we believe in the power of our Black male youth as uh, leaders, as innovators, as problem solvers, as just young people who uh, are very much deserving of being, you know, happy and well. Um, and that's really what we do every single day at the core. I know many people associate us with technology and with, um, you know, uh, programming, coding, apps, et cetera. But, you know, our first job is to make sure we've got um, Black boys, young men who are identifying as such and, you know, uh, hopefully able to live and operate in a community in a space where um, they can feel inspired. And, and safe and free to make mistakes as people do and they're free to learn from them and grow so Tyron is a great example of this uh, as, <laughs> as a, as a uh, celebrated mistake maker you know he'll never admit any of them uh, but as also a tremendous individual tremendous leader uh, as he's always been and uh, tremendously uh, you know capable person just in general but today of course, Kyra, we're talking to the people about technology, right? And, uh, you know, it's interesting because a lot of times when people talk about the work we do, they talk about um, young people like yourself, uh, your young, you know, your, your brothers coming behind you, those who came before you, almost as a function of a gap, you know, it's like, oh, let's can we get them caught up, right? But like, if you had to, let's talk about now, but let's actually go back to 2016 first. If you had to profile, profile yourself with respect to your cap capacity and competency related to technology in 2016, you know, coming into your first year with the Hayden Genius Project, how would you have described your competencies at that time? Um, I was no coder, but I would definitely say I would always see myself as competent um, in that avenue. And though I definitely was able to build my skills through the classes, um, I would say, I don't think I went into the Hidden Genius Project feeling that my deficit was ability. Um, my deficit was experience. My deficit was access. I'd never been in a space where we looked at um, those things and we saw, uh, you know, a bunch of Black men in one place coding, a bunch of Black men in one place doing really anything but playing a sport, right? Um, and so I, being in a place like that, in a space like that, uh, developing those skills was a big thing for me, but even bigger than that was just being in the setting and having the experience. And so looking back at myself now and even looking at the geniuses uh, I have the pleasure of teaching and interfacing with today, I would say that if we're looking at, you know, how do we build us up, we have to identify that barrier, right? What is the barrier to success? And for me and a lot of the geniuses that I have had the pleasure of working with, that barrier is not necessarily ability as much as it is access or as much as it is resources. And so the biggest thing for me that I took away as a student was being connected to these resources and experiences that are necessary for you to have that connection and have that moment of saying, I wanna be this, I wanna do this, I can do this. Or even just the materials that you would need like a laptop or a few dollars in your pocket. All those things make it so much more possible for you to want to aspire and to do all these things. And if we look at some of these facts on the right side of the screen, we can see that it's not aspiration that we're lacking, right? So 63% of African-American high school students directly enrolled in college between 2014 and 2016, which is up from between 26, uh, 2006 and 2008. Likewise, African-American college attendance is increasing at a rate 
way higher than white college attendance. So the aspiration is there. The desire is there. What is not there is the access. What is not there always is the resources. And so when we're talking about how do we get people into this, how do we get people more involved in the collegiate experience or just success in general, it's increasing that visibility, but it's also increasing that access to it. What are the stopping people from going to college? What's stopping people from pursuing careers? It's not the lack of desire to be successful. It's the lack of resources needed to become successful and needed to pursue that. And so uh, just taking it back to that original point. Yeah, as a student, I never really looked at myself having a deficit of ability or of skill, but I definitely had a deficit of experience and exposure mm -hmm. to even wanting to be a coder or wanting to do technology. It wasn't something I was thinking about, not because I wasn't aspirational, but because it wasn't presented to me. All right. Okay, talk your stuff to young genius. Uh, now, so I guess in short, right, the, it seems like step one first then is to reframe, reframe our understanding of who our young people are, who our community is, right? And sometimes we, we get caught up in narratives. That's what I heard you kind of mention, that the narrative can outpace the actual reality. And you look up and we're talking about our young people, especially sometimes our young men in terms of gaps and what they aren't, but you're standing right next to him like, well, that seems pretty solid. You know, it seems like he got a lot of potential, like he could use some networks, but it's hard to put somebody on when you keep talking about them as though they can't be, right? So um, we definitely appreciate you sharing that. Before we jump in even deeper into the tech piece, uh, can we talk a little bit? Did you end up looking through that Nielsen piece? Or no? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, can you talk to the people a little bit? about what the data tell us as well. So you shared some data about achievement more broadly. How about with respect to technology? You know, because a lot of people say, oh, our, you know, we don't get tech like such and such gets tech, but I, I don't know if we would agree with that either. Um, I wouldn't agree with that, just both through the data and the experience I had. Oh, oh. We can't okay. hear, we can't hear the other speaker. Can you speak a little louder, please? Sorry for interrupting. Uh, me or Brennan? Brandon, thank you. Okay. Is that better? Is this better now? Yeah, it sounded like you were um, in a tunnel. Yeah, Brandon, okay. it sounds it... like you're in, you're echoing and you're sure. in a... I just changed the microphone. Is it better now? Yeah, I or think the same. Microphone. It's the same. Okay, we'll, we'll keep working on it. Okay, um, but yeah, even just looking through that piece and having the experience I've had over the years, uh, directly working with students, I can tell you for sure, like the ability piece or even the we don't get it isn't the thing. When you have these programs and you sit them down for six weeks, you come out with kids who have amazing websites, amazing apps, all these great projects and all these great abilities. And we can see that it's not a deficit of like, if, oh, if we sit them down and do this, they can't do it or they don't get it. Even when you look at computer science classes in high school. These kids are interested in it. These kids are getting it. These kids are successful at it, but you have to be presented with it. How many of these high schools are actually offering AP computer science principles? How many of these students are actually having access or actually being promoted through your hour of code? Here's a laptop with which to pursue all these things. My first experience ever having a laptop was from the Hidden Genius Project. I wouldn't have even had one to go to high school with had I not gotten mine from the Hidden Genius Project. And so all these things that we think about, like we wanna get our kids involved in technology with what, with what platform, with what materials, right? Um, it's not necessarily that they don't have the passion to do all these things. And we even look at some of those facts from the Nielsen where it's like 63% of us are enrolling into college and that's still going up. And our college attendance is still increasing. And so people are trying, people are putting their best foot forward. But if you are getting barriered out of the things that you want to do because you don't have enough money to pursue it or because you don't have enough time to budget towards it or because of all these other extenuating circumstances, it falls through the wayside. It's difficult to keep up with trying to do all these different things without the proper supports. And so it's great that we do have organizations like the ones that are here today and that even more of those are becoming a thing and coming out of the shadows because we need them. We need kids to see that, you know, they exist, 
But we also need parents to know that there are supports in order to help their kids get involved in these things that aren't just based upon themselves uh, or that they do have a village behind them. Uh, I can say like, for instance, my own parents, even as a student and now as a semi-teacher for the Hidden Genius Project, uh, I had very supportive, very active parents, but there was no way for them to give me all the things I needed when it came to doing tech or building a leadership aspect to myself or even learning how to build community. That all comes uh, from the community. And so we definitely- And well, Kyrie, and let me jump in here real quick. So you don't, don't, give, them, don't give them the whole sermon just yet. You know, because we gotta get the plate ready. Uh, so <laughs> just, but real quickly, just so we can see this, this is interesting because it starts to speak to your point. What we find is, like you said, you had your first exposure to accessing a laptop with the Hidden Genius Project, and yet you're accessing tech all the way up to that point, right? And so if you actually look at these graphics, right, and this is from a Nielsen study back in 2018, ultimately, uh, we're all up in tech, uh, even more so than the total population, even more so, as you can see, the non-Hispanic white. We're, nobody's streaming more music than us, more video than us, messaging more than us, uh, you know, using voice assistant. And if you get into this deeper into this report, we're um, between the ages of 16 and 34, we're the most likely early adopters of new technologies. We're also the most likely to say we're willing to teach someone else, be it someone in our family, a friend, that same technology, right? And we're also leading the world in content creation and influence, right? So when we talk about things like development or what have you, you know, uh, uh, you know, black students still represent roughly 6% or 7% of computer science majors or computer science degrees, excuse me, conferred an undergraduate, uh, computer science engineering undergraduate degrees conferred in the nation, right? And so, yes, there's a lot, we could do a lot to grow and yet we, we're based in a lot, right? We're, we're, we're building on a fairly solid foundation. You see half of us use digital wallets, <laughs> right? Like we're doing all this and we're willing to do it. We need platforms, we need avenues, we need people to, to believe in us, and we need, um, you know, people to then, of course, be willing uh, to then uh, elevate us, right? So it's not today, if we're coming into this conversation today, we're not at a point of crisis, and this is a, and some problem-solving exercise about how to get our, you know, Black young people to snap out of it. In fact, we are very much snapped into it. Uh, we set the pace, we set the tone, uh, but we have to create avenues and channels to uh, strengthen our young people's networks. We also have to understand that, um, you know, you'll turn on the news or you'll read a story and they'll say they're not gonna hire Kyron because Kyron is qualified and we need more people to go to the Hidden Genius Project to hire. But, you know, the first person who ever built a computer for us was my uncle. The second person was a black woman named Jenny who'd worked at Intel for quite some time and got tired of it. That's 30 years ago. You know, my third computer got built by my auntie and she was the first person I knew who could write in DOS commands and my mom could too. Like, that's what I learned. I learned all my tech from black people, including a whole bunch of black women. So people keep telling us there's not enough, but those people weren't getting hired or retained or elevated or promoted back then. So with some of these, you know, narratives we have to let go. But what that means from our perspective today is as a community, then we have to build the infrastructure to empower, equip, and also employ and hire resource our young technologists right where we are. And there's a lot of opportunity there. So Kyron, I know uh, we're supposed to move on in a few. What, what what more do we need to let these people understand? Because I know we'll have some opportunities to discuss in a minute. Oh, and I you can put your slides back up if you want to. So. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think the biggest thing that we have to consider is that, again, our barriers to success are not desire, it's not ability. Our barriers to success are community, capital, opportunities, right? We need to have all those things ready for our youth in order for us to be with good conscience promoting that we are doing the work, right? The work is not about getting these kids smarter, it's not about making them competent, it's about putting food on the plate for them to get ready to eat. We don't have to teach them how to eat though. And so that is the biggest thing. The more that we invest in the success and education of our youth, the more that they'll be able to invest back into their communities in the world. The more Brandons that we have, the more me's that exist out of that. And there's not one-to-one. -one. There are hundreds of geniuses that have come out of the Hidden Genius Project from a few people's dream and passion, right? And so I will go on to teach 
countless more geniuses than just the one me. And so the more youth that we empower in that way, the more that we give back to our youth, that shows in how much they give back to us. And it's not just the Hidden Genius Project, it's EOIDC, it's the San Francisco Foundation, it's the CUR, it's the Glover Center, and so many more organizations that are helping bridge these gaps. And I see it in my community. I have siblings who've worked their first job at EOIDC, and that set them on their path of doing anything for a career, right, where they might have sat at home. I have siblings who've gotten their first pair of shoes that they really, really liked from the Oakland Natives Gifts Back uh, that they do every summer. All these things and all this community support doesn't leave these kids. It sticks with them and they want to give back later. But if your community can't give to you or doesn't give to you, then what can you give back to your community? And so we definitely have to make sure that we are looking at it. Like Kevin said, those three organizations that he worked with, look at how many organizations he's worked for and with after that. All that lets you know that you can believe in yourself. You can set lofty goals and you can execute them when you see other people doing them and you see people supporting you through that. And so definitely our investment in the youth will show in the future. Thank you for that. And, and just, uh, I know we had a quick message from Hattie. Kyron, you mentioned that. I didn't want the point to get lost. Kyron and his peers actually already do teach technology programs in the community on behalf of the Hidden Genius Project. So if folks are thinking about, you know, shorter prog uh, programs at their sites. It doesn't have to be high school. It doesn't have to be black uh, youth. It doesn't have to be boys and young men. Uh, we pour into these young people, as Kyra mentioned, and then, you know, they uh, multiply from there and they lean on each other. And so we are, um, you know, willing to uh, build opportunities together to reach uh, different populations uh, and for those of you serving young people. So um, Kyron, I definitely appreciate you. I'm, I'm proud of you. Uh, Kyron's also, of course, serving as uh, a, a communications and social media intern with us. So, you know, he's leveraging the skills he developed early on and making money with us. And yes, uh, Selena has mentioned, uh, we, you know, and in fact, let me say, the reason that we have this entire approach to be able to train our alumni as youth educators is thanks to the technical assistance of Ms. Selena and ESOP Youth Development Center uh, that created this opportunity for us roughly six years ago. Uh, and we've only been flying from there. So thank you to Ms. Selena and Ms. Regina and everyone who helped make that possible. Uh, so uh, thank you everyone for your attention. I know we've got to keep it pushing, but we will certainly look forward to the dialogue in, in a bit. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Brother Chiron and Brandon. Um, thank you for telling us about your experience, what you're doing with the Hidden Genius Project. It's very inspiring and uh, we uh, continue to, uh, we look forward to continuing to support you. <clears throat> Next, I want to introduce uh, Brother Devin Baldwin. Um, he, he's doing a lot, so uh, I'm gonna warn you right now. Um, he, he's, he's juggling a lot right now, um, but I, I wanna tell you a little bit about him. Um, uh, Devin was born and raised in uh, Los Angeles and he moved to Oakland in 2018. He's in his final year at uh, Cal State East Bay. Good work. And uh, he's studying computer science. <clears throat> he is a content creator, a web XR developer intern at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. In the near future, he'll start working with Zooks, a self-driving car company where he will be involved with vehicle operation and testing robotics. His passion about education justice and closing the digital divide and educational disparities within black and brown communities also led him to be an instructor at the David E. Glover Center, as well as lead instructor at STEM Tank where he teaches high school students about emerging technologies such as augmented reality, virtual reality, and mixed reality. Um, I don't know when his brother has time to sleep um, based on doing all of that, but, um, but we welcome you and look forward to, uh, to your presentation. Thank you. You can go ahead and share. Thank you so much, Kevin. Um, first and foremost, can everybody hear me? Yes. Can you see me? Yes. <laughs> we see you. Okay, cool, cool, cool. And we hear you. That is beautiful. That's that's exactly what I needed to hear. Let me share and then we can get started. Let me do this. 
Okay. Can everybody see my screen? Yes, love it. Okay, cool, 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 cool. Just want to give a brief background. <clears throat> Excuse me. I want to give a brief background on my title. So I, I titled this for a, a specific reason. Why I teach kids or why I teach WebXR in underserved communities. And let me give a little bit of background on myself. Um, as you heard previously, I'm from Los Angeles, but I moved to Oakland roughly four years ago. I'm a transplant. Since my time here, I've I've learned to love Oakland, learned to love what Oakland is, what Oakland stands for. Um, I did not intend on being a teacher, a molder of minds. I've always wanted to inspire, but I never knew I had the ability. Um, I also live in East Oakland. I go to Bancroft, shoot hoops there all the time. Not so much anymore. It's gotten a little, a little out of hand at the park. Um, but that is where I made my first contact with the youth of East Oakland. I could play basketball. They'd be talking back and forth. And you hear the atmosphere in which they live in. You hear the experiences that they experience. And then along with that, you see the pitfalls and the good things about things. But then also you see, you know, where there's a lack of leadership. You see where there's a lack of, you know, constructive use of time. Because I was playing basketball, but a lot of the younger kids were more so set free to do whatever they please. And they didn't always make the right choices. And from there, I knew that I really wanted to get involved with mentoring or having some type of leadership acumen to display to the kids to show them like hey there is somebody who cares there is somebody who will listen to what's going on with you and show you a better way so luckily i was able to get into um i was at laney college at the time and i was able to get into this program involving intel and ousd it was my first experience actually teaching. So we, we were tasked with teaching kids how to build augmented re reality re experiences. And at the end of the program, we had a showcase and the kids just, you know, seeing their eyes light up when their parents, you know, they were like excited to show their parents what they created. They were doubtful at first, but they stuck to it. They got it. And it was just a very rewarding feeling. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of context and background before I get started. So I'm going to go ahead and jump in. I know I'm rambling at this point. So just a little content outline. I'm going to go through my intro, a little piece on so social justice, which is more so educational justice. The, the the digital divide, the importance of representation, what WebXR is, because I know a lot of you are like, don't know what that is. It's okay. We'll get there. And then, of course, my closing remarks. First and foremost, my name is Devin Baldwin. I am a WebXR developer, um, also a senior at Cal State East Bay and intern at Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory and lead instructor at STEM Tank. Um, th this is a, a model of myself. It is not really me. It's not a picture. This is a 3D model. <laughs> so it, just wanted to let you know, if, if you have not seen one before, this is what that is. So let's go ahead and get started. So when it comes down to social justice in terms of distribution of wealth, opportunities and privileges within society, you know, we see a lack of distribution of wealth, opportunities and privileges within Oakland, East Oakland specifically. There are many programs, beautiful programs, which a lot of them are on this panel. 
thank you all for being here. Thank you all for doing what you do, first and foremost, because Oakland needs it and the world needs it and Black people need it the, the most. So you just offer it. Educational justice. So is more so involves the but basically the encapsulation of social justice, but from an educational standpoint, it's just making sure that involves schools and communities that work to provide equitable and adequate distribution of quality, teachers, resources, and education. That is what I hope that we are able to do here today, because like, Kevin stated earlier, this is not just simply a Zoom meeting that we're here on to just, okay, let's check the box. It's morning Zoom meeting. We got everything that is said here today, everything that has been expressed, everything that we will discuss afterwards must be put into action. This is not simply just an exchange of words. It is an exchange of actions. It's putting a plan together. So the more that we discuss, the more that we involve ourselves within this panel and discuss and you know, really brew up conversation, the more we can put towards action. But, so the digital divide is the gap between those who have access to technology, internet, and digital literacy training and those who do not. One thing I really enjoyed, luckily I was able to meet the founder of STEM Tank through a ad at my school. And I had been looking for something. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna start a nonprofit. I'm gonna teach kids in East Oakland. That is what I wanna do. Just from my experiences living in East Oakland, I wanted to do that. That was something I was, super, super adamant about, I wanted to do that. Luckily, I found STEM tank. I mean, if it's not broke, why fix it? If I can't make one on my own, why not join some, some something that's already tackling that problem? So through STEM tank, I was introduced to the David Glover Center. And it was literally five minutes away from my house. Like I live in East Oakland. So five minutes away, I stepped in, I looked at the computers, I looked at the facility, they have the laser cutting, they have the 3D printers, and just, they had so many resources. And it just blew my mind that this was here and I did not know about it. And I was like, why aren't more people, like more kids just, why are they not more involved within this center? The center has a wealth of resources. Because as far as the digital divide, the digital divide is lack of access. It's the lack of access. So with what the David Glover Center provides is access to not only resources, but to trained people who actually care about the youth, they care about their development, they care about the progress. So that's what really, you know, really drove me to like really be excited about coming to work and teaching the kids every day is knowing that, hey, I'm contributing. This is what I always wanted. I've navigated the tech industry. When I first came out here, I went to so many conferences by myself, conferences, meetups. I was literally the only Black person there. A lot of the times, I was the only Black person there. And it's a very scary space to navigate if you are, you know, you feel like, you know, I am I too Black for this? Like, like I really had to ask myself that. And then, like, I had to catch myself. I'm like, wait, well, what am I even asking myself? The fact that I'm here just shows that it's not that I'm too much. It's that I just knew about it. I had access because I made myself available to 
the possibility of me being there. So, especially during my time, I also interned at Samsung. I also interned a little bit at Intel at Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. Once again, still very much a very close knit, you know, industry, close knit space where I was the only black person there. And through there, I learned what the future holds through VR, augmented reality, mixed reality, XR, and robotics. So especially at Samsung, when I was at Samsung, they were creating this very, very new innovative thing. And it just really scared me because I knew that we would be impacted the most. Like, I know it sounds crazy, robots are gonna take our jobs. Sounds like some Terminator stuff, but let me just say with all sincerity, most of the jobs that we work now, that black and brown people work, you know, retail, customer service, those jobs won't be here in, in the next, 20 to 30 years, less than that, probably, because they will be replaced by AI and robots. You already see that happening in San Francisco. So that's also one of the main driving forces. It's like, there's just a digital divide. We need to know this information. This information is very important because if we're not coding the robots who are taking our jobs, we're at a loss and we're very much so not in the loop and we're most impacted. And that was my greatest fear. Um, but as far as the digital divide, there are, there's very much, very much the universal access divide specifically in East Oakland. And also I wanted to speak on the importance of representation, being visible, being tangible, and belonging. What I mean by being visible is me. I am a young Black man. But when I teach students, they see me, I have dreads, I don't code switch, I don't you know, speak a certain way to make anybody feel comfortable. I speak how I speak whether it's in meetings, whether I'm giving speeches at conferences, I don't code switch. I don't speak white to appease people. If you're uncomfortable with how I speak because of where I was brought up, that is your bias that you need to get over. I'm going to continue to be my most authentic self within these spaces. And when I do meet Black people in these spaces, they're so caught up in like being someone else. And then they see me speak to people and they see how I operate and they're like, how do you do that? I'm like, you just have to be yourself. Being you is just enough to be great. No need to switch up who you are. So that's the visibility aspect being visible, being a Black educator, having more Black ed educators, and being tangible, being there for the kids to actually see you and interact with you, ask you questions. Because the number one thing, you know, usually people who are very educated, who are, you know, have the knowledge and the skill set, sometimes when we teach, and I've asked my students, like how are their teachers? Are they getting what they need from their teachers? And a lot of times they say no, because the teacher, you know, mainly just is there to teach. They're there to, you know, they sometimes get too caught up in teaching when also a lot of the times a very important aspect of teaching is listening. Because you learn a lot when you listen to what your kids have to say and you can adapt your teaching style to how they learn. Because not everybody's going to understand how you, per, how you, how you convey something. 
you may have it in your mind, okay, I'm going to teach this and everybody is going to understand. This is going to be great. It's not always how it goes. You know, especially when I'm teaching WebXR, it's a very, you know, intricate subject. But at the same time, I'm thinking everybody's going to have the same experience. But through teaching this year, I learned that that's just not the case. You have to adapt. You have to adjust. So you have to listen to what your students are, are saying to you and then adapt. Um, and then belonging, making them feel like they belong, giving them to the necessary room and space to navigate the problem, not so much hovering over them, you know, checking their progress, but letting them navigate the problem at hand, letting them mess up, and then being there to be like, oh, well, it's, it's all right. Look, try this and just, you know, giving them little tidbits so that they can pick themselves up without feeling like they failed miserably and then you had to come and save them it's more so like hey just minor adjustments so feeling like they belong in there and just giving positive reinforcement you know i think it's very important when teaching black and brown kids that they need that positivity they need that love they need that reinforcement because a lot of times you know they come into class they're not feeling so great you know you should start the class off with something inviting and invigorating to get them to get their minds out of their out of their current state and get them ready to learn about what we have to teach um and then coming to the portion to what is webxr i know <laughs> I was going to explain this. So WebXR is an API for the web content and apps to use to interface with mixed reality hardware, such as VR headsets, glasses, integrated augmented reality features. So I'll explain that because that may not come across for a lot of people. So WebXR stands for ex extended reality. It's the encapsulation of virtual reality and augmented reality. So I'm able to create virtual reality experiences on the web. So in most cases, an Oculus headset has a web browser. You can log onto the web browser, click the link that's provided once you create this experience and you can automatically be transported in this, into this experience. So this is what the kids learn um, and they do pretty well with it. Um, I actually have a couple of pictures of, of them coding here up top. And then also they go into the headset and they are able to experience what they're coding as they're coding it. So it's, it's all primarily through a link. It's, it's primarily through a link they, and they use GitHub. They, push their changes up to GitHub, and then they're able to see what they just made in real time. Um, the reason why I teach WebXR specifically is because, first of all, it's really cool, really fun, and it is an emerging technology. Me personally, I've been in this field for uh, five years but it's still very much a new thing. It's not fully adapted within normal society or the industry. Just now, this like past month, LinkedIn is starting to post WebXR jobs, where as before, you would never see that. And my students alone have created many experiences that now they have on their resume. They have GitHub accounts, like in there in high school, but they have projects that they can literally submit to these companies and they would get the job. They would get that job that, you know, somebody who is a software engineer who doesn't know anything about WebXR wouldn't even possibly get whether you are an engineer or you're solid in your foundation of coding or not 
it's just the understanding and the way you break it down. These kids just get it. These kids are brilliant. I introduced 3D modeling within my class because it's a big part of XR and they just grasp it. They, they just latch onto it because it's something that they can get involved in and it's the most exciting thing. It's really amazing. Um, and, uh, excuse I'm sorry. Me, excuse me, brother Devin. I just want to make sure that we, uh, that you, um, try to try to wrap up in the next minute or so so we can have time for a break and whatnot no problem I'm sorry. we also want to have time for questions i know a lot of people want to ask you some questions so we need to yeah. get to the round table because those questions are coming up absolutely my, my okay. God, i get so caught up in the this the is, thing, this but is I will wrap up. this is fascinating and a little scary for people like me who were thinking <laughs> oh really <laughs> so um so what we what would be really great is if you could close it up now, but we want you to to definitely be ready for some questions because people are are asking about some of the things that and it's going to take a discussion. Oh no, of course, okay. and that's what we are here yeah. for. Uh, but in closing, the David Glover Center doesn't not only does it serve, you know the youth of East Oakland. It serves the community. It serves the community. It serves its people. It serves me. I, I, I love going in there, being able to access the access technology machines. It's just a very integral part of me being who I am now as an educator. It's where I got my shot. It's where I curated my class. And now I'm coming out with a WebXR class online, and that will be coming out within the following month. So, but with all that said, I was able to elevate my own personal education and my own personal experience through the David Glover Center. And it's just been an amazing experience. And I'm glad that it's here for the youth of East Oakland in the community. Wonderful. And I, and I close. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm gonna pass back over to Kevin and, and not interrupt the flow. No problem. Let me stop sharing. Thank you, Devin, for sharing your experience, and thank you for all that you're doing, teaching our young people. And um, and yeah, I know that that there's some some questions folks have. So let me let me. Um, so I'm very proud to introduce uh, Selena. Um, we saved the best for last. Um, she very much is success personified. Um, she, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll read her bio. Um, she serves as the CEO of East Oakland Youth, De Youth Development Center. She's an alum of EOYDC and she graduated from Castlemont High. She is Oakland through and through. Um, she got her bachelor's degree in human services from Holy Names University. And she went on to earn a Master of Science in Learning and Organizational Change. When she completed her graduate studies, she served as a management consultant for the uh, Organizational Transformation and Talent Division of Deloitte Consulting, where she worked with private and government sector clients to deliver large-scale change management solutions. She returned to EOIDC as Vice President of Organ Organizational Effectiveness in 2015. In this role, Selena leveraged her multifaceted skill set to streamline operations across the organization and to enhance program effectiveness through evidence based practices with a focus on trauma informed, healing centered care for the systematically marginalized youth of our community. In addition to her work with EOIDC, Selena advocates for a systemic change based on the foundational principles of belonging, dignity, justice, and joy through her work with Decolonized Design, a global organization leading the movement to envision a more just and joyful world. And with that, I hand it over to Ms. Selena Wilson. Thank you, Kevin. And uh, definitely not uh, saving the best for last, but I do think 
being last is best because I get to piggyback off of all the brilliant points made by all of my uh, colleagues and co-conspirators in this work. Uh, with that said, looking forward to kind of briefly talking a little bit about um, our work in this process and shout out to our uh, cousins, as I like to call them at the Hidden Genius Project, uh, Brandon Nicholson and Chiron Loggins, uh, as we, we will be able to reference some of what we've been doing with them as well as with our youth. And the title of uh, this presentation is Nothing About Me Without Me, Co-Designing Youth Programming with Youth. And so um, I think that the brilliant folks that went before me talked a lot more about the technology. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the process. How do we actually design programming? Um, and with our youth, not just in mind, but central to the process. So uh, the mission of EOIDC, simply put, is to develop the social leadership capacities of young people all the way from age five to age 24 so that they are prepared for employment, higher education, and leadership opportunities. So we do a very wide range of things um, for a very wide range of ages and count on partners that have deep expertise in specialized areas like the Hidden Genius Project to ensure that our young people are getting that kind of nuanced education around things like coding and web XR, right? Rx? Yeah, XR. Okay, not prescription. XR. All right. Uh, <laughs> so as uh, I think Kevin alluded, I am an alumni of EOIDC. So I actually grew up, this is young Selena here, uh, once upon a time in my EOIDC gear, uh, speaking on behalf of the organization. I think I was about 12 or 13 in this picture. Um, I actually started at EOYDC when I was four years old and participated in a range of programs um, all the way through college and certainly into career. And so this is an example of what it looks like <laughs> when you put a young person in a leadership position. I got my very first job at EOYDC coming out of middle school, the first summer after uh, middle school. And I remember when we had interviews for the summer internship that year it was the day of my middle school graduation from Havis Court Middle School. I, being a neighborhood kid, was not aware of expectations for interviews. I showed up. I changed out of my graduation outfit and just put on some, you know, jeans, Nikes, white t-shirt, showed up. I saw everybody else in their interview finest. And I started to cry. <laughs> and one of the youth directors, uh, who many of you may know in the community, Ryan Austin, um, she was 19 years old and pulled me aside and reassured me, interviewed me, and I still got my opportunity. And so what started out as an internship at the age of 14 ultimately led to many subsequent opportunities to be in a meaningful leadership position as a young person, which then positioned me to be in the position I am in now as the first EOYDC alumni to serve as CEO of the organization. And so we can see uh, through lived experience, the power of our model, which is grounded in what we call cascading mentorship. And uh, without belaboring this point too much, essentially our cascading mentorship framework creates formal leadership positions uh, at various levels of the organization that allow young people from middle school through high school through college and beyond to be in meaningful leadership positions, to have formal roles. Um, yes, yes, hey, Ms. Court, shout out, go Panthers. Uh, <laughs> so this is a critical aspect of our model, which is why I am not unique. While I may be the first EOIDC alumni to serve as CEO, I am not the only member of the executive team to be an alumni, our chief program officer, Dr. Lana Hill as well, and 70% of our professional staff are EOYDC alumni. And so this tells us something, right, about what happens when we don't defer leadership uh, until people are have their college degree and already fully baked, but really create those opportunities as we go. And we partner with organizations like Hidden Project, as Brandon mentioned, to talk about how can we integrate more cascading mentorship 
in youth serving organizations so that young people uh, like Chiron, like young Selena, like young Landon can be a part of the leadership team, even as they are uh, still peer age uh, as it relates to those that they're serving. And so a few guiding principles that are key when we are thinking about cascading mentorship and how to ensure that it is uh, all the things that Devin talked about in terms of ensuring that young people feel a sense of belonging, ensuring that they feel a sense of meaning and significance, ensuring that there's meaningful visibility. So one is the recognition uh, that youth are subject matters experts of their own experience. Um, and so we have to understand the importance of seeing them as experts and honoring that. Youth are also able to influ influence their peers in ways adults cannot. And so we have to understand and respect the importance of, uh, yes, mentors who are our elders are important and that peer connection, that peer mentorship plays a very special and unique role that we need to honor. Uh, youth also need to be exposed to more leadership positions that uh, actually provide them with opportunity, responsibility, and trust. Learning is also enhanced uh, and retained better through hands-on experience. So what better experience is there for young people that we're trying to uh, teach how to be leaders than to ensure that they actually have leadership roles? And also understanding that experienced adults do play a critical role in providing resources, nurturing support and guidance. So we're not saying, uh, hey, uh, us older folks, we're no longer needed, we're irrelevant, right? But we are saying, how can we really create this space for there to be meaningful power sharing and a meaningful exchange of the expertise that we all hold based on our life experiences uh, and our kind of generational expertise. Um, so a few things that I wanna talk about really briefly is really understanding that co-design can be a very powerful process. And it is a process, it is a deliberate process, uh, one that uh, really requires a lot of thought, a lot of planning, a lot of intentionality. And so thinking about how uh, folks in positions uh, to make decisions within youth serving organizations can really be intentional about creating co-design processes that involve young people, that involve the families that you serve, that involve a cross-section of all of your key stakeholders, but making sure that youth have a meaningful seat at the table. Also leveraging a breadth of tools. You know, we're talking about technology uh, and there are certainly a lot of high-tech design tools that are important and Sometimes, you know, you just need to get some post-it notes <laughs> and some markers and allow young people to, to think and dream in different ways. So we have all different kinds of tools that we teach the young people, uh, along with other key stakeholders, to really have tools that help them to engage in radical imagination, as well as kind of map out their experience. So everything from journey maps uh, to kind of these criteria matrix tools, to storyboarding. What are the different tools and ways of processing our imagination can we be leveraging? And there's so many resources out there, uh, but really, again, when we're thinking about this process and designing the process itself with intentionality, making sure there's a wide range of tools. Also, making sure that we are mindful about uncovering the layers of oppression. You know, we're talking about social justice and we cannot talk about justice without understanding how oppression operates. And so to, to that end, we have to understand that there is the structural component of oppression that is in the very fabric of our society. We look at the founding documents of this country. It was very clear that all rights and privileges were reserved for a very small group of white land-owning Christian men uh, and so when you're working within that foundational structure, there's going to be a lot of oppression uh, that is just foundational and bleeds over into every institution that we have from our educational institutions, the nonprofit industrial complex, all of these things are rife with oppression that is interwoven. And then this feeds into our interpersonal experiences of oppression, how we treat each other, how this shows up in our interactions. And then, and this is one of the most insidious layers of oppression, how are we internalizing our own oppression? 
And this gets to a very important point that Devin made that often shows up uh, for young people uh, and other folks from marginalized communities. To the extent that we who are leading spaces have not contended with our own internalized oppression, we are not equipped to create true belonging for the people that we're seeking to serve. So when we don't examine toxic uh, frameworks like code switching, the, which is very different than versatile communication, right? Because code switching suggests that there is something wrong with the way that Black youth communicate and that they need to switch uh, for a dominant culture versus understanding everybody should understand how to communicate vers versatilely to different audiences, right? And so it's in the framing, it's in the thinking, but we do have to examine our own mental models around where have we internalized anti-Blackness, where have we internalized uh, homophobia, where have we internalized classism and how can we contend with those things so that we are creating truly welcoming spaces for the young people who need to be there the most. Uh, because when you talk about Devin, for example, East Oak, uh, some of our East Oakland youth, having spaces they could be at, we have to ask why aren't they going in? Sometimes it's a lack of awareness. They don't know that that's there accessible to them. And sometimes there are some spaces where young people just simply don't feel welcomed. Uh, because they do not re meet whatever the respectability politics standards are. So we have to be thinking about how we can meet young people where they are. Yes, it's important to help them understand how they can live their life with dignity and self-actualize and all of those good things. But, and yet, we want to make sure that we are doing so from a place of solidarity and care and not a place of kind of oppression-based thinking. Uh, to that end, with adults, we also have to be mindful of power dynamics and how we're working with young people. Whether you know we have positional power most often, and there is often power that comes uh, with having a certain number of years under your belt. Um, and so, you know, while we don't want to diminish the importance of respect for elders, we also want to make sure that we are all being respectful of our young people as well, and thinking about you know, in the design process. For example, when we, we go through co-design, there are certain steps that I don't participate in because I am aware of the power of my role and my mere presence in the space, no matter what I say, it can be intimidating. So I need to create space for people to engage in the kind of conversations that they may not feel free to engage in if the CEO is in the room, right? And so thinking about how we can be mindful about the reality of power di dynamics. Um, and, you know, I honor, again, want to really emphasize the importance of folks with lived experience stepping into the role of elder, because there's a difference between being older and being an elder. <laughs> an elder really decides to take the mantle of guiding young people and is intentional about that. Um, and this is an African proverb uh, that acknowledges that while the youth may be able to walk faster, the elder knows the road. And so there is value in being able to help young people navigate those paths that we have navigated. That said, when we're thinking about design, when we're thinking about tech, we also have to recognize that those well-worn paths are not always the way forward. And so we have to understand that the changing tides of our world, the challenging demands that we have, the unprecedented things that we're dealing with, require that we also be open to exploring uncharted territory. So what got us here will not necessarily get us there. And so we have to really contend with the fact that, you know, there are two ways. There's a status quo, keeping things how they are, and there's a revolution, which is really about an openness to turning things around. Um, and while there may be elements of the status quo that are valuable that we want to retain, we have to think about what are the things that we really need to be uh, willing to let go in service of our collective liberation and in service of our young people. Um, and in closing, would someone be willing to unmute and read this quote? The revolution has always been in the hands of the young. The young always inherit the revolution. Huey Newton. Thank you. And so I close with this thought and uh, looking forward to engaging in conversation how we 
uh, can really be in solidarity with young people as they inherit this revolution. Thank you, Selena, uh, for that. So uh, we've heard a lot of um, great ideas from our presenters and um, we did intend to give y'all a, a little bit of a longer break. Um, we're gonna move right into the round table, but please feel free to step off and uh, take a break uh, if you need to, um, by all means, please do that. Um, Okay, that's shy screen. Okay, so um, I will uh, kick off with um, with a, a question. Um, given that we have folks uh, on this call who are representing uh, many different parts of our community, faith based organizations, foundations, nonprofits, etc. Um, any one of our any one of our presenters, what are the intersections that exist between community and faith based organizations, foundations, government and technology companies? What are those intersections that exist? And to the extent that we need to um, build those intersections, what will it take to bring these entities together to produce the kinds of resources that our young people need? How can we work together different types of organizations? Is this uh, question directed to one of our speakers? Yeah, okay. um, and anyone who wants to, to speak to that. Okay. I can, I can call folks out, so. Can you reiterate the question? So I was responding to comments in the chat. My sure, sure, <laughs> yeah. So how can we forge intersections between faith-based organizations, nonprofits, foundations, government, what's the best way for us to work together on the kind of structures that will produce the change that we're all advocating for? Any ideas? Uh, I have some ideas. Um, so I think that, uh, Often, I think that we need to start with why, uh, shout out Simon Sinek, and really get clear around a collective purpose, a collective outcome. Um, and there's a lot of growing work that started to bubble up in Oakland around the framework of collective impact. And I encourage folks to Google collective impact, um, which I think offers a great framework for how organizations across multiple sectors faith-based, nonprofit, public sector, private sector can really collaborate in the service of collective impact uh, for the entire community. Um, so I think using a framework like that is helpful. And then I also think, as I mentioned, we have to uh, have collective guiding principles as well, uh, because I think one of the things that can sometimes um, be problematic in trying to work collectively is when we're not all aligned on the values and principles that we're going to be upholding. So again, when we talk about things like belonging, what does that look like? How can we be cultivating that? So forth and so on. So I think uh, those are some of the things. The other reality is that you need someone to be holding that. And Collective Impact talks about the importance of having a backbone organization that really serves as the facilitator of all of this because all of these organizations are doing so much work, you need someone uh, who could take the charge of really facilitating the process itself. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have, so, a, I, I have a comment about that, uh, Selena. Um, hello. Um, uh, you know, when we talk about certain things like belonging, for example, um, for those of us who have one foot in the corporate world or some other arena, we know that some of these terms have been hijacked and they now mean different things to different people. Um, is there a way to communicate things like 
the principles, the principles that began behind DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, without getting tied up in the nets of what it has become. Ah, so you know I have a very strong point of view on that. Yes. <laughs> And I will share an article about that. So without going into too much detail, decolonized design was actually originally born um, out of a desire to disrupt what we, we call the diversity uh, and inclusion industrial complex. And while there are terms that can be reclaimed, there are some that have been so co-opted that we actually advocate for re reimagining something totally new. So I've we can't be woke anymore? <laughs> Right. Uh, you could be awakened. Uh, no, but yeah, I, I think that there is a, um, I don't believe in policing language. I do believe that we're, our words shape what we can imagine. And I think that the, there are limitations of the concepts of diversity and inclusion in that they are relational terms, relative terms, diversity in relation to what? Our society has taught us that diversity is in relation to dominant culture. So anybody not white, not heterosexual, not Christian, not, you know, so forth. Not, you, not. You lay, <laughs> we're diverse and, you know, and that makes no sense. But when you think about belonging, dignity, justice, and joy, it's a universal principle. So whether we're talking about a multinational organization with all kinds of diversity or a small family business where there's not even diversity of last name, Everybody needs to feel belonging, dignity, justice, and joy. So anyhow, put that in the chat. And I, I, but I do encourage us to think about what are the ideas, and this goes back to the balance of the status quo and the revolution. What are things that we do want to carry forward with us from the past? This goes back to Sankofa. And what are some of the things we want to bless and release? Um, and I, I think that there are, there's a lot of conversation to be had and youth are excellent thought partners in that and thinking about what are the things that we should be carrying with us from the past and what are some of the things that we want to release collectively in service of our collective liberation and prosperity. Thank you so much. I'm going to toss it back over to Kevin because we have so many questions from all of you in the chat and Kevin is going to field most of them and I'm going to jump in as well. Uh, when Thank I you. when I need to, Kevin. <laughs> Thank you, and um, I, I want to invite um, uh, Ms. Uh, Hattie Tate to uh, come off of mute. Uh, it looked like you had your hand up and wanted to uh, say some things or ask a question. So I just want to say good morning to everyone. It has really been a blessing to be here. I am from the town. I am um, about five blocks from the David Glover Technology Center. I have been blessed to send my grandchildren through EOYDC. So to be invited at the right now moment to be here to listen, to hear and share in this thought process within our community is very huge for me. I appreciate the invite, Kevin. I love, love this. And yes, this is about action, no more talking. We're going to be doers of what we've put together today. Thank you. Ashe. Dr. Lawrence Van Hook, uh, please uh, come off the mute. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Kevin. Uh, I echo the sentiments of my first cousin that just went before me, <laughs> Miss <Hattie. laughs> Um If if and this may not, I occupy faith space, educational space community space, advocacy space. But right now, I need to hear from these three power brokers. How do you describe faith and religion into your dialogue? What role does it play? Does it play a role at all? How do you reimagine it? What does it mean to you? Um, do you redefine religion? Do you weave new narratives? Now that's a big conversation, but I want to begin to get to it because we have faith partners uh, that has been a part of these processes. But we got to talk about the real conversation, and that is: is religion based upon how we how we 
operate in it? Is it useful for where we're trying to go from your perspective? Um, I'll jump on that um, first. Um, that's actually a great question because I also was thinking about that as well and how to convey that. You know, because me personally, I am a Christian. Um, but as far as a lot of my kids, they're not essentially fond of the idea of religion. They understand spirituality. They say that they're spiritual. But as far as them being confined to a religion, they're not really big on that idea. Um, so as far as from my perspective, I think it's important. I think some aspects of the religion can be blessed and let go. But the faith-based aspect is very much a thing that is important. Me personally, having faith in a higher power is definitely something of a driving force for a lot of us um and moving forward i think it is important to have somewhere to where you could be grounded a foundation if you will because a lot of our youth are a little lost you know they don't have a foundation they don't have a grounding and for a lot of us raised in the church, it, it, that was one of our things that kept us grounded was knowing that there was a higher power and knowing that we have a greater purpose, knowing that our steps will, will be blessed. You know, like every day I will wake up with, with the notion of that my steps are blessed. I am guided in my mission. And I think it's important to instill that within our youth so they understand the importance of, under, of understanding their purpose and understanding that having a foundation can help you in your moments of weakness, in your moments of, of uncertainty. Yes, I agree with you, um, Devin. Um, may I ask a question of Chiron? Yes, definitely. Chiron, I, I, I'm a writer, and um, and I uh, had an opportunity to do some work with David Glover Center. And one of the frustrations that our instructors were having at the time is that many of the students were able to very quickly, seamlessly pick up the um, some of the the um, technology principles, but they were having trouble with their reading. Um, how do we, as we, how do we um, take advantage of all of these opportunities that are coming up in technology? How do we, and Selena, you can answer this question as well. How do we get our youth ready to, to um, in terms of their foundational education, to be able to grab onto these opportunities when they present themselves. And I'll mute myself. Um, yeah, definitely. And I think a part of that is, you know, continued exposure. The first time you're exposed to something, you may not uh, be super primed and ready to take that on or uh, engage with it. Uh, but I definitely think that, again, like, had they seen those concepts before, had they seen readings like that before, the more that we expose um, our students to and our youth to, the more that they can handle. But even on top of that, um, when we look at literacy and uh, our literacy in comparison to average or even just in comparison to non-Hispanic whites, uh, a big thing that we talk about is expectations and not only setting lofty expectations, but making sure that as instructors and educators, we're creating a space where that expectation is reachable and possible, right? And so if we have students and we're reading them something 
and we're realizing like you're getting these concepts, but the reading part is hard for you. We got to slow down. I can't keep going with you because the concepts are good or because I want you to get that part. We might have to sit as a class and create a glossary of these words that and these concepts we haven't seen before. Or we might have to just do all those things. But I think that identifying that, you know, these concepts aren't the issue. It's the reading the part that's the issue. Or this isn't the part that you're struggling with, but it's this other piece. When you can identify that, okay, like the literacy is this issue, taking extra time just to make sure that, especially those of us who are not in like the high school classrooms or in those spaces where we're in the traditional schooling, um, we may have to take a little bit of extra time, even if it's not in our program description to help uh, build you up to that baseline. Because again, I can't really layer so much onto something where the foundation is not strong already. And it's not the youth's fault that the foundation is as strong. They don't have that many resources. And so we may have to become that resource, even if it's inadvertent. Hey, we're going to go over these words before we get into this. And that was a big thing for me, uh, even as a student of the Hidden Genius Project. Before we really got into coding and all these things, we had to learn, like, well, what is an algorithm? What does it mean to do abstraction? All these words that you may think, like, you've encountered before or as an instructor, because we hear them so often, it's like, this is second nature to us. Uh, we have to realize again that one of those biggest pieces of barriers for the youth is exposure. And so exposing them to that and taking that time with them uh, is to me the biggest thing that you can do to help them bridge that gap. Thank you. Thank you very much. One of the things that, that I would um, say in response to that, um, from a very tactical perspective, I think it's important that we meet our young people where they are. And uh, typically they're found in school. Um, they may be found in, in church or, or other organizations, but meeting our young people where they are with what they need is to me what equity looks like. So very tactically, uh, one of the things that we hope to do is put together an education summit where we bring folks together mm -hmm. from uh, district schools, from even charter schools, from, um, you know, our, our school board, um, bring together these organizations who are doing youth development work to figure out how we can administer these programs in our schools and really reimagine what the curriculum looks like, who's delivering the curriculum, and, and what our uh, young people are exposed to. Because as you've heard very much, um, exposure is, is the biggest barrier in most cases. It's not that our uh, ch uh, young people can't perform, it's that they may not be exposed or they may not get the kind of education that they need when they need it. And um, as, as I believe, the, the folks from the community who are closest to our challenges are also closest to the solutions. So uh, to me, bringing our organizations that are led by black folks into our schools to meet people where they are is to me one of the solutions that we need to work towards uh, very tactically. We have a couple of hands raised. Um, I believe um, brother Ethan Barry was next. So please feel free to come up and meet. Thank you. Thank you everyone. I'm, <clears throat> I'm very pleased to be a part of this discussion. I was um, informed about it. <clears throat> And I was really excited that a group of uh, people who are actually on the ground doing the work were getting together to define how to work better together. Because I believe that's one of the answers to a lot of the questions that um, I have raised personally. Um, Selena, congratulations on your new position. Hearing your background, I have like high hopes for what you're going to do to take it to the next level. Um, technology is a part of going to the next level, but it's not just technology for technology's sake. We have to understand how to utilize technology to our benefit. And so the things that the young man Devin was talking about things that Brandon was speaking on. Um, those are quintessential. However, when someone brought up the religious aspect, um, that's where we have to bring 
all of these things together and not only, you know, listen and, and take the good and bless the other stuff, as you said, Selena, but also build on the here and now and the future and include the, the older leaders so that they won't be, as we eloquently said, you know, young people feel like they're left out. That feeling creates animosity and other sorts of emotions that need not be there if people know that they are part of the solution and they're not being pushed out. And that's the, the main point that I wanted to make. And I think more of these types of um, get, gatherings should be done in the future because as things move forward, um, we want to keep track of what's working and what's not working and what was tried and what, you know, uh, didn't we try? This is a fast paced society. We get misinformation by the second. A lot of what we vote on, people are either for or against or on the fence because of their belief systems. And so that's why I posed the question about the cognitive dissonance within okay. the religious framework. Yeah, Thank so you. I will. Oh, sorry. I, I saw in the comments a couple of people wanted me to weigh in on the religious uh, piece and the tension with 501c3s. I will try to speak very briefly to this because some folks may not know, but we are actually legally not allowed to promote any specific religion as a 501c3 nonprofit. And you can lose your nonprofit status if you do. And so uh, I think it's important for you know faith-based organizations to understand that in this partnership work, we have to center the, the work and, and you can embody the spirit in the work. Um, and we cannot, you know, uh, promote the religion specifically in doing the work in partnership with each other. That being said, and I'll keep this very brief to the point Devin made, a lot of folks, uh, young people and, and others, including myself and, and other folks in generation, um, I think struggle when it comes to religions like Christianity um, with what they learn about the history of how it's been used to colonize and to justify things like slavery. And so I think kind of understanding where young people feel those points of tension. And I think, you know, traditionally, like when I was coming up, you ask questions like that, it's uh, walk by faith, not by sight. <laughs> and uh, Generation Z is not satisfied by that answer. So I think really, uh, rightfully so. So really being willing to have those tough conversations, really being willing to acknowledge the harm that has been caused by institution, like how people have used institutionalized religions to justify things. I think not shying away from those conversations when you are in religious spaces are important for young people to feel honored, respected, like their questions are being validated um, and understanding that some young people uh, may be embrace other forms of spirituality, um, whether it be people returning to and understanding uh, African and other indigenous based systems of spirituality and finding how can we still embrace their sense of being connected to the divine or a community um, or doing work uh, for a greater good without them feeling alienated because they're not necessarily subscribing yeah. to a specific religion. So I know that was a, it's a very, we can have a whole webinar just on that. Um, and then I think again, to your point of, we do need to create space to make sure that our elders feel honored and respected as well. So I do think also facilitating intergenerational dialogue about difficult subjects, having facilitators who know how to navigate those discussion between the generations to create more mutual understanding in the spirit of, um, you know, collective liberation and mutual respect. Thank you, thank you, Selena. We have a, a hand raised by um, Lorraine uh, Provost. Uh, please go ahead. Uh, thank you for allowing me to just make some comments, and I'm going to have to discipline myself because I am wordy. So if you feel like you need to cut me off, do that. 
But I want to uh, just say that uh, on Selena's comments, I really uh, welcome all of the comments she said, and she's dead on it in terms of not um, relying on current things like woke, woke and being it, and not holding that so tightly so that there are people that are turned off by that and don't even understand what that means. So I think she's dead on, dead on. And that organization really has a good uh, track record for uh, doing what it needs to do in terms of our youth. But I also wanted to say a bit about um, Ocur. I think Ocur is in the position to actually hold some of those things and lead some of those efforts that we need, even if they're only done twice a year. I remember when uh, um, Ocur used to do the the big conferences, maybe once or twice a year, and bring all of this, try to bring all the sectors together. That was the best, and that's what we need now. Uh, I know the funding may not be there, but we need to find some kind of way if all of us can, maybe who are on this call, donate to Ocur. Think about that, because there is a disconnect between youth and the religious organizations, Christianity, whatever it may be. And I think our faith leaders have a great role to play in this. When you are preaching your sermons, and I am Presbyterian, Baptist by tradition, mm -hmm. when it's a Catholic school, so I'm familiar with a lot of denominations. They, the faith leaders have a lot, to, a lot of work to do in that. And let me just say one more thing. Going where, the, where a lot of our youth are, on the fields, especially on Sundays, they're on the fields. And a lot of those uh, coaches, they are members of congregations, but you don't see them in church on Sundays because they're on the fields with these kids. Some kind of way, if we're gonna go where a lot of our people are, we have to figure out how to involve these coaches and these people who are doing these new programs, supposedly, some of them for a lot of money to bring families in. And, the, and instead of the families being where this maybe should be on Sundays or should be during the week, they're on these fields. So we have to find a way that we can connect some of this conversation we are having to those coaches so they, 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 can, they can hear what they need to hear and connect those students. Because if you look around in our churches, a lot of teenagers are gone when they reach teenage. Because a lot of them are, are aspiring football players, basketball players, and good students. Parents too, we have to, so there has to be a kind of wraparound. And that's why I'm saying that O'Carl may play a good role in engaging the sectors together, maybe once or twice a year, because this one this morning is on youth and technology focusing. We need to bring, we need to have one, because I think all during the year, there is a special focus on some particular segment. O'Carl can correct me if I'm wrong about this. And I, I have attended a lot of these. Thank but, you. Thank you, Lorraine. Hi, I, I appreciate uh, can someone that. from uh, can one from a, a call in make a comment? That's up to our moderator. So thank you for letting me. Okay, well, I'd just like to make a comment. First of all, it's, I find it ironic that we're talking about technology, but there was no uh, call in number posted uh, included with the Zoom uh, information. Uh, so just a note for uh, future, please uh, include call in number because a lot of particularly black folks are part of the digital divide. I uh, just wanted to also comment regarding the uh, young lady that just spoke about the wraparound services. Uh, sounds like a good idea. And uh, as far as the terminology and the glossary, there is a basic for uh, the need for literacy, because even though if you have a glossary and things like that, you still have need the basics of literacy. And perhaps the churches, the Black churches, which was uh, the crux of the Black organizing community, as the lady commented, uh, many of the young people are gone from the churches, so maybe the churches need to rethink and reimagine how to include uh, the youth uh, and not only just from a, a religious point of view, but a spirituality point of view. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Uh, so we're just about at time. Um, I, I want to leave with uh, a couple of calls to action. So I, I want us to all recognize that we're in very unprecedented times, um, not only because of COVID, but just the pace of change in our society, the uh, 
the, the pace of advancement in technology and therefore the pressures that our young people face right now. Um, our young people are going through things that we didn't go through, that we haven't been through, and we have some um, knowledge, some wisdom to impart on our young people. But I encourage everyone to talk to the young people in your lives, in your neighborhood, on your block, um, and, and really ask them, what are you facing? What are the pressures you're dealing with? Uh, because we really need to understand where our young people are at today to really understand what solutions to bring to them. And I know that this was, this was uh, touched already uh, by Selena, but I really just want to lift it up and echo the sentiments that uh, we really need to start by listening to our young people and understanding what they're dealing with so that we can put in place structures to support them and guide them along on their journeys, which will look very, very different than all of our journeys. And then the next thing is to, um, to work with one another. So the challenge is to find someone on this call who uh, you want to do some work with, some um, topics that have been brought up that you see some intersection with what you're interested in and what you're working on so that we can take this, uh, this time together and really turn it into action uh, behind this meeting. So um, if we can do those two things, we'll be in a, a much better shape to, uh, to um, help uh, shape our, our community in the, the way that we all want. So, uh, so thank you. Um, thank you, everyone. Kevin. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to say something, and that is that, um, Kevin, if it's okay with you, um, we'd like to share uh, your contact information with all of the participants. Kevin and I have had a lot of conversations about, okay, what comes next? And, and he is so humble that he neglected to talk about some fantastic ideas that he has about what comes next. And one is in fact, a summit. We don't know where that summit would happen. We don't know what the time frame is, but we're talking about bringing like-minded and, and not so like-minded people together to have conversations about how to make this happen for our community. And as I said at the beginning, it's time to stop talking about it, what could possibly happen next and do something concrete where we can see some results, where we can actually um, say, okay, because of our coming together, our kids have a better chance of being able to participate in what is available. Um, and, and as the saying goes, if they are not given a, a seat at the table to bring a folding chair, uh, to know how to do that. And so we're going to share, we're going to have all of this information to come to Kevin Hill. And, 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 and Kevin and I are going to work together to see that happen. Um, one of the things Elaine Provost, Lorraine uh, Provost talked about is some of the big gatherings that we used to have years and years ago. And, and I did those with David um, and it was a lot of work and it should happen again, but it should happen again with the lens of where we are now. So um, we have one last thing, please don't go before you do the evaluation. You can do it, it, it is right here on the spot. Um, please fill it out. Uh, you'll be shocked at how easy it is for you to do. And um, I wanna thank all of you, all of our presenters, our amazing moderator. We could have gone two more hours on this topic, but that just tells us that more discussion is needed. So I wanna thank you all. Please complete your evaluation. And, and when we send you Kevin's information, um, please contact him so that we have a way of getting back with all of you and making this happen for our youth. Thank you again. Thank you. We also, like I put in the chat, just in case anyone didn't see it, um, on everybody's, all the presenters' bio slides, I don't know if anyone noticed, but it had their email addresses. So you're welcome to contact the presenters if you had a question that maybe wasn't answered um, or anything like that. Or if you just have general questions, you can email the email address in the chat, which is just info at occurnow.org. We'd love to help you with any of those. I know we were a little bit rushed at the end.
And, and can the information be posted for of uh, uh, for those of us that are on call in that mm -hmm. we are not being able to be able to chat? Is there a, a resource where we could obtain the contact information and yeah. or can that be included? Absolutely. Yeah. So we are um, after the workshop, we send out um, the slides and a recording of the Zoom, the whole Zoom workshop um on our website we, we email it out and we also post it on our website um so assuming that we have your email address you will be emailed that and if not it's going to be on our website um a model built on faith.org perfect thank you yeah no problem there's one thing i have to say and that is when it talks about faith we're not talking about religion faith and religion are two different things i just want everybody to remember what the name of this program is it's a model built on faith. And San Francisco Foundation, our funder, has done an amazing job of navigating this very difficult topic uh, for years and years and years. And we're very grateful to them for doing that. And especially with Michelle Miles Chambers and you remember Tessa Caillo as well. And so we're gonna continue navigating in this arena because we need the faith organizations whether people are religious or not. And I just had to say that. I hope I didn't offend anybody by saying it, but that's just the truth. And thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Carmen, I don't know if you wanted to mention our upcoming workshop. Um, um, go ahead. Oh, sure, yeah. We have a, another workshop on August 25th. Um, it's called Reimagining Community Engagement for More Funding and Greater Impact. Um, so we are going to be sending out information about that. We'll also post it on that same website I mentioned earlier, a model built on faith.org. Um, but yeah, just wanted to put that out there. Mark your calendars. We'd love to have all of you there. Um, but we will be sending out emails just to kind of remind you that it's happening um, for you to sign up. And yeah, we'd love to have you. But thank you so much to everyone for coming. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Bye-bye.